I'm the co-founder of the Girls Academy, a project under the Incarcerated Nation Network. And I'm here today with Terrence Coffee in the Fire Next Time talk, a, a book by James Baldwin, along with Bob Mualama. And here's Professor Coffee. Hello, Tracy. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to take this time to thank each of you for joining us here today uh, for our third reading and discussion series of James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time, uh, The Revolution of the Social Justice Movement. Uh, this reading and discussion is sponsored by Humanities of New York. Uh, all views and opinions are solely of those of the participants and not that of Humanities of New York. Uh, today's series is being hosted by Incarcerated Nation. Uh, along with this host, who will also be my uh, partner today in crime as we discuss some very relevant and challenging uh, issues. Uh, it's also, this is also being held in conjunction with the Social Justice Network and our partners at New York University Silver School of Social Work, My Fresh. Exodus Transitional Community, Youth Strong, Midtown Community South, and Central Synagogue. But before we begin, um, we would like to take a moment to recognize uh, the victims uh, and the communities uh, in Buffalo and across the country that have were impacted by the May 14th uh, shooting. And Liz is gonna pull this up for us. Victims of the recent Buffalo shootings, Marcus D. Morrison, Andre, McNeil, Aaron Salter, Pearl Young, Geraldine Talley, Celestine Cheney, Roberta A. Drury, Haywood Patterson, Catherine Macy and Ruth Whitfield. Also three, the three individuals that were injured uh, in this tragic event, Zaire Goodman, Jennifer Warrington and Christopher Brandon. As you may know, uh, for the past few weeks, we have been hosting these reading and discussions uh, in relations to real and relevant uh, issues of race. Even myself, I was acknowledging to our uh, team prior to coming on, uh, in a sense, I think that we've been discussing these matters from a systemic perspective and a systemic lens of systemic racism and how that impacts communities and outcomes, wealth and poverty. However, uh, <clears throat> on May 14th, as each of you know, in Buffalo, New York, a white supremacist uh, who's connected to uh, a 
certain ideology took the lives of 10 African-American citizens, injuring three um, as well. As we've held these conversations over these past uh, few months, uh, we've all have been inspired in a sense We've been uh, encouraged. Our participants uh, have self-reflected to see what role that they may possibly play uh, in challenging the social and racial structures of racism in our society, not only from a systemic lens, but also in our personal lives. What roles can we play? M may 14th was a stark reality check for us, black and white who have committed ourselves to effectuating change and promoting the idea, the idea of equity and equality and seeing ourselves through the lens of America whatever that is for us today. I don't mean to sound as somber as I sound, however, there is a reality that we are now living in, in this moment as we speak and understanding that there's also a manifest that was tied uh, to uh, this tragic event. Today, we're going to have a bit of a different format for our conversations. Uh, today, I will be having a conversation with Fama Luke Ock, who's the founder of Incarcerated Nation, discussing the state of America today, race relations, and what does that look like through the lens of Black America and America. But before we begin, I'm going to uh, hand this over to Five, who will give us a reading from Baldwin's work. And we're going to engage in a conversations on race relations in America and where we're at today as a country. Five. I think you're muted, Five. Thank you. Sorry about that. Had a little mouse trouble on the screen. So, you know, I'm so prolific in some of this context, but I also want to read this because I believe it's a stark reality just holds a present. And it so touched on feelings that this country have not done. And so from one on, starts a different perspective from his mind. And Baldwin reads, Americans find it as ill as white people out there do to dust themselves with the notion that they are in possession of some intrinsic value that black need or want. This assumption, for example, may allusion to the need problem depend on the seed in which Negroes adopt the standards. It revealed all kind of strike case from humanity's assurance that a Negro can become present for three years to the fortunate tone of warm congratulation with which so many rules address their Negroes. It is the Negro, of course, who is presumed to have become equal in achievement that not only proves the common forging fact 
that perseverance has no color, but overwhelmingly cooperates the white man to his own values. Alas, value can scarcely be corroborated in any other way. There's certainly little enough in a white public or private life that one should desire to imitate. White men at the bottom of their hearts know this. Therefore, a vast amount of energy goes into what we call the new problem, produced by a white man's profound desire not to judge by those who are not white, not to be seen as he is, and at the same time, a vast amount of white wish is rooted in white man's equally compelled need to be seen as he is, to release. From the harmony of his mirror, all of us know whether or not we are able to admit that mirrors can only lie, that by drowning it is all the way to one there. It is for this reason that love is so deeply sought and suddenly avoided. Love takes off the mask that we hear we cannot live without, and we live within. I use the word love here not in personal sense, a state of being, a state of grace, not the infantile sense of being maybe, but the top universal sense of daring and growth. And I submit that that the racial tent that many Americans see have little to do with rural empathy. On the contrary, we are involved only symbolically these tensions are in the very same depths as the which love springs or murder. White man's unlimited and apparently tame, unspeakable fears and longings are projected onto the need. The only he can be released Hi. from the need to run power. Sorry yes. to interrupt you, but your reading is a bit choppy. I don't know if it's the connection, but it's just a bit choppy. Not too sure if it's the hit buzz or something is making it choppy. All right. Americans today have little to do with real empathy, on the contrary, indeed, and are involved only symbolically with color. These tensions are rooted in the very same depths as those which love springs or murder. The white man's unadmitted or apparently to him unspeakable private fears and longings are projected onto the Negro. The only way he can be released from the Negro's tyrannical power over him is to consent. In effect, to become black himself, to become a part of that suffering and dancing and dancing country that he now watches wistfully from the heights of his lonely power armed with spiritual traveler chests, visits serpentitiously after dark. How can one respect, let alone adopt the values of a people who do not on any level whatsoever live the way they say they do or the way that they should? I cannot accept the proposition, the proposition that the 400 year travel of the American Negro should result merely in his attainment of the present level of the American civilization. I am far from convinced that before released from the African witch doctor, which foretell, I am now in order to support the moral contradictions and the spiritual artery of my life pecked to become dependent on an American psychiatrist. It is a bargain I refuse. The only thing white have that black people need or should want is power and no one holds power forever. White people cannot in the generally be taken as models of how to live. Rather, the white man himself in school in sore need of new standards, which will release him from his confusion and place him once again in fruitful communion with the depths of his own being. And I repeat, the price of liberation of the white people is the liberation of the black being. The total liberation in the cities and the towns before the law and the mind. Why, for example, especially knowing the example as I do 
I should want to marry your sister is a great mystery of me. But sister, I have every right to marry if we wish to, and no one has the right to stop us. If she cannot rise me to her level, perhaps I can raise her to mine. In short, we, the black and the white, deeply need each other here if we're really going to become a nation. If we ate really, that is to achieve our identity, our maturity as men and women, to create one nation has proved to be a hideous, difficult task. There is certainly due need now to create two, one black and one white, but white men have far more political power. I'm going to stop right there. I'm sitting here talking and introducing uh, Arlene and, and I'm on mute, so I apologize. So Arlene, please join us. Okay. I underwent during the summer that I became 14 after long religious crisis. I use this, this word religious in the common and arbitrary sense, meaning that I've been discovered God. Oh, I got back on. Okay. Arbitrary sense meaning that I discovered God, his saints, his angels, and his blazing hell. And since I've been born in Christian in the Christian nation, I accept his deity. The only one. I suppose him to exist with with nothing within the walls of church, in fact, our church. And I only suppose that God and safety were synonymous. The word safety brings us to the real meaning of the word religious, as we all use it. Therefore, the state in another more accurate way, I became during my 14th year, for the first time in my life, afraid. Afraid of the evil within me and afraid of the evil without. What I saw around me, that summer in Harlem was what I so always seen. Nothing had changed. But now with it, without any warning, the whores and pimps and racketeers on the avenue had became a personal menace. It, it had not became before occurred to me that I became one of them. But now I realized that I had been produced of the same circumstances many of my cohorts were clearly headed for the avenue. And my father said that I was headed that way too. My friends became, began to drink, smoke, and embark at the avid and groaning on their sexual careers. Girls only slightly older than I was who sung in the choir or taught Sunday school. The children of holy parents underwent before my eyes an incredible metamorphosis of which the most bewildering aspect was not their budding breast or their rounding behind, but something deeper or more subtle in their eyes, their heat, their odor, the affection of their voices. Like the strangers on the avenue, they became in the twinkling of an eye utterly different and fantastically present. Oh, in the way I had been raised the abrupt discomfort that all of this aroused me, aroused in me, and the fact that I had no idea what my voice or my mind or my body was likely to do next caused me to consider myself one of the most depraved people on earth. Matters were helped by the fact that the holy girl seemed rather to enjoy my terrified lapses of grin, guilt, guilty and tormented experiences, which were at once as chill and joyless as a Russian separate and higher, hotter by far, by far than all of the fire of hell. Yet there was something deeper than these changes and less 
definable and frightening to me. It was the real in both the boys and girls, but it was somehow more vivid in the boys. In the case of the girls, one watched them turn into matrons before they became women. They, they began to manifest a curiosity and reality rather terrifying single mindlessness. It was hard to say exactly how this was conveyed, something impossible in the set of the lips, something foreseen, seeing what in the eyes of new and questioned determination in the walk, something perpetuary in their voice. They did not tease us, the boys anymore. They reprimanded us sharply saying, you better think about what you're, about your soul. For the girls also saw the evidence on the avenue, knew that the price would, would be for them of one misstep, even that they had to be protected, but that they were only protected was us. They understood that they, must act as God's decoy, saving the souls of the boys for Jesus and blinding the bodies of the boys in marriage. For this is the beginning of the burning time and it is better, says St. Paul. Who else? Elsewhere with a most unusual and stunning and backwards, describes himself as a wretched man to marry, then to burn. And then I began to feel it in the boys' curiosity wavering, bewildered, despite despair, as though they were not settling for the long, hard winter of life. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. And we'll you be want me to continue to read? Uh, we'll, con we'll come back and we'll unpack that with our uh, audience today. Uh, okay. Please stay on, stay on watch. Uh, again, I want to thank each of you for joining us today for uh, this conversation. Uh, as I shared earlier, we're going to be doing something a bit different in light of the current tragedies uh, in Buffalo. So, Five, if you could come off mute, I would love to open this conversation up for you. <clears throat> One of the challenges that we've been facing five in regards to race, social justice, equity and equality was the, the seemingly fear of violence. And we can see that when we talk about police shootings, uh, police violence in our communities, even those who went as far as to say uh, the fear of black on black crime so to speak, whatever that is. How do we digest this recent incident in America? Or how are you digesting it? How do you think America, particularly uh, Black America, is digesting uh, this, these recent events? You know, I think that's a, one, thank you for that, you know, that, that question. Um, it is very, sort of relating to what Baldwin had spoke about, what I was just reading, as into this sort of lack of understanding of the structure of American history in which whites were purposely withheld back. They had the same properties and the same sort of uh, privileges as, as poor Blacks, but they were overseers. And it needed that time frame for America to get its feet on the sand in some sense. And then there was a couple hundred years where whites were allowed to progress, to get housing, to get laws, right? And then blacks were also held back for these sort of four or 500 years, right? And so with that inequality, there becomes this sort of resentment when whites who had this longer period of progression. And you know, I just wanna be very honest, we live in a country that starkly tells people this is a white country. When we look at the constitution, when we look at the sort of racial beginning, it says this is a white country. So these people were told this is a country and these people are not people, they're subhuman and they'll be used as like fodder for society. They'll be purchases. They'll be the number one consumers in this world. All you have to do is pick yourself up by your bootstraps, which doesn't apply to people of color and you'll be okay. And then when they see successful upbringings because people of color we've had successes 
throughout all of this struggle, we still succeed, right? And so Baldwin says that, you know, white America looks at blacks in a sense of they're trying to achieve what white has. And what does that, what does that give them internally? A feeling as something is being taken from them on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, right? And so let's juxtapose that to what's happening in Buffalo. You had a white supremacist, a young man who frequented the store weeks before he came to attack, who vented verbally online on his Twitch page, which is a video game outlet page, and then came back and murdered everyone, right? After having problems there the night before. And so inside of him, I feel, is this feeling that something's being taken from him. The manager said he asked her for money the night before. She said no. So he feels like he should owe that, right? And violence has always been that answer when it comes to uh, an easy solution, right? You just pick something, you blame it, and you go for that. But we live in a country, like Baldwin has said, that has posed and, and poisoned both sides. It has fed misinformation to a generation of people for years. When school segregation and integration first happened, we learned that, oh, they were reading Uncle Tom's Cabin as a Department of Education mandatory book, right? And so there were people who were taught uh, that their race was superior. This is something the state is telling you, that you go to junior high school and your teacher's telling you, these people are niggers, and you are an embodiment of God. And so I believe that strikes this anger, which will never quell until we fully recognize the history and uh, try to move forward on a page of equality with some type of reprimand for these hundred years of disenfranchisement. All right. And, yeah. And I, I really want to stay in that vein in regards to that anger, with regards to that resentment uh 2016 2017 if i'm not mistaken we all watched the march at the university or what we call we now refer to as the tiki torches marches and uh jews and americans and blacks and minorities across the country watched this and it was almost like for our our elders in our communities who were seeing the march of the ku klux klan uh back in their era so we we now have uh, a march on a prestigious academic institution there. Uh, we're seeing this. Uh, do you think that the political, and I, and I have to try to find, and I, and I know, you know, I, I, want, I'm, I, I guess I'm trying to be nice here. Well, I don't know why I'm trying to be nice, but I'm trying to put it in a context of modern times because we know through the historical lens when we thought about the march of you know the civil rights movement in 1965. We know about the lynching. We know about the beatings. We know about the dogs. We 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 know through history how we can look at the fear of our predecessors who came before us in line with this conversation. How much did the political rhetoric of 2016 under former president President Donald Trump do you think that led? to this uptick because as we, you know, we can we can actually track that. We're not saying it wasn't there, it was always there. However, do you think that political retort from that administration led to this, this uptick uh, that led, that, that we may be seeing from the Tiki torture marches to the uptick in uh, violence against Asian Americans, African Americans to a manifestation of what we saw May 14th? I agree with you hundred percent. I mean, I'm just going to be honest, like this country has led promises of the past, even when we say we overcome it, right? When we think about the reclamation period and when uh, Juneteenth happened, we said, okay, Blacks are free, but we're going to honor all of these, you know, these slave masters and these generals with statues and figures that we still are taking down today, right? We're only going to name colleges after these racist and, and, and egregious people. And I think that that sort of uh, permanence to pay homage, of course, um, to, 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 to those who have start, sparked this country under a system of capitalism has only been like doubled down by a literal elected president stating and reconfirming these facts. 
And so you have about four or five, 400 years of just rhetoric and rumors and myths and lies. But publicly, starting around the 70s, I would say Nixon's campaign, politically, it was never said, right? It was just use keywords. We had Reagan's uh, 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 assistant on tape stating about the war on drugs and how certain keywords, really talking about Blacks, really talking about segregation, really talking about keeping uh, Blacks hurting more than whites. But we can't legally say that. And so it became this, you know, uh, sort of rhetoric on TV and verbal words and all of these uh, dynamic gymnastics when you're talking about speaking. But in actuality, the laws and the political concept impacted the country. And then you fast forward 2016, right? You have a president who's literally saying it with his words, actions, and deeds. <clears throat> and that confirmed for people that all of this rhetoric for hundreds of years was true. You had the Proud Boys, you had six other groups that popped up out of this, right? And we're not talking about just like this Tea Party group, right? Talking about political legislation and, and government positions. We're talking about people on the ground, everyday homeowners saying that a black person in my community is literally gonna take away from my community. We're living backwards into Baldwin's era. And I think Baldwin said it right when the only way of success in America is the speed as in which two black people have to then assimilate into what whites have considered society. When we look at Tulsa, look at those rights, whenever we define community for ourselves, they have been quick to abolish that just like any other upbringing from slavery because they look at it as society is still a system of slavery and we're revolting by that by just having equality. And so I think that there's this notion because America plays both sides just as like international banks sold weapons to the South and then to the North. And that's how we have a national death when we break the colonies, right? Just that same concept, uh, it's playing both sides by using race as a dominant factor. And so, yes, it also gave the government the ability, because Trump was president at the time, to create paramilitary troops and on TV, live on Twitter, uh, sort of validate them. Even at the, remember at the pre presidential candidate hearing, stand down, hold back, right? Like talking to your private militia. Mm -hmm. All your speeches is speaking about the people in this country, which is code word for uh, white Americans are being overrun by these other people, right? These are the same rhetorics. And so I see, I feel like we're in the same time as the fire next time when he was writing it. And the same concept of when conservatives and people who consider themselves allies today say, well, you know, in 20 years, we can have this. That's you recognizing that there's inequality now and you have no problem about it. Just as Baldwin mentioned that Bobby Kennedy's assurance that, yeah, we can have a Negro president in about 40 years. Not that I will work to empower that today, but after I'm gone and not here, it probably will happen, right? That's the statement he was saying. And so, yes, it very much empowered it. I would say directly empowered it. He created his own social media network. We've seen so many of these sites uh, taken over by young people like Twitch, when this person was committing a mass murder of people of color, activists, a woman just stopping off to get bread, a father getting cupcakes for his son real quick, jumping into the supermarket. And he comes in with a live stream helmet on so the rest of his friends can view these murders. He literally wrote nigger on the site so that they can see it through the camera as he kills them, sees the white man, oh, I'm sorry, and continues to murder people of color. It just, in my mind, all of these pictures of barbecues at lynchings, all of these pictures of people complacent comes to mind. And that's the era in which Baldwin is speaking and writing from, and it's we're still living there today. So right. yes, political rhetoric, yes. Same thing as Kennedy said, political rhetoric endorses that. Endorses that. Let me read something, and this is from Fire Next Time on page 98. Uh, this past, the Negroes past of rope, fire, torture, castration, uh, emphasize, rape, death, and humiliation, fear by day and night, fear as deep as the marrow of the bone, doubt that he was worthy of life since everyone around him denied it, uh, sorrow for his women, for his kinfolk, for his children, who needed his protection and whom he could not protect. Rage, hatred, and murder. Hatred for white men so deep that it often turned against him 
and his own and made all love, all trust, all joy impossible. This past, this endless struggle to achieve and reveal and confirm a human identity, a human authority, yet contains for all this horror something beautiful. I do not mean to be sentimental about suffering. Enough is certainly as good as a feast, but people who cannot suffer can never grow up, can never discover who they are. The man who is forced, uh, forced each day to snatch his manhood, his identity out of the fire of human cruelty that rages to destroy it knows if he survives his effort. And even if he does not survive it, if something about himself and human life that no school on earth and indeed no church can teach. I wanted to highlight that particularly back to the fear, particularly about the historical fear, particularly about the historical humiliation particularly about the historical uh, emasculation, as we, we say in our common terms of the Mac man in America, unable to protect or find his family or find his identity as a man. Is, is, is that fear real for black America today? And I, I wanna, make clear, and I, I think you already know, is that fear real for parents when uh, they're dressing their children to go out uh, to play, to be careful, or uh, school programs that teach young men how they should conduct themselves with law enforcement? Is that real? It, it, has that fear now expanded, uh, in your opinion, and, and how do we begin to address that? It's, it's, I think it's very relevant, very prevalent. And I was speaking on this, you know, yesterday at a press conference that being a black man in America, this fear of hate, violence and, and, and crime and constant bias attacks permeates every part of my existence. I'm a black father uh, that, has, that is raising five sons. I have four stepsons and two stepdaughters, which literally uh, every moment of the day, you have this trauma of what's happening, right? We live in a city where I could send one of my interns to the store and he's going to jail. Like he's gonna end up in Rikers, give me a call tomorrow. And how do we stop this? I, I wanna reflect on something and I just wanna reread one sentence that I was reading to pertain it to what Baldwin is saying. And in this sense, he says, therefore a vast amount of energy goes into what we call <clears throat> the Negro problem is produced by the white man's prof profound desire not to be judged by those who are not white, right? We have a system where mass shooters are patted on the back, given McDonald's, depending on the complexion of their skin, where we had this kid, Kylie, whose mother drove him to uh, Milwaukee, Kenosha. He has an AR-15, he murders a couple of protesters. The police in the tank walks, rolls by this child, a teenager, says, are you okay? Is there problems out here? Right, and continues to go arrest the protesters which he just murdered. And then he gets out, of course. And so it brings me to a conversation that I had when I was locked up. I got transferred to Albany County. I'm in solitary. There's this huge riot in the jail. So everybody's in this box and I'm in this closed custody box because they felt like I just came to the facility. So I caused all of this. And for about a month or so, I was locked next door to this Aryan. And he was a lead in leadership position as well. And I had the most profound and depth conversation with this person after, of course, a couple of days of every curse word we could think out through the vents, right? So we gate banging for like two or three days and then we got tired. We decided to have real conversations like, bro, why do you hate me? Like, I am not your enemy. I am not, I don't even know you. Like we just locked in together. I haven't even seen you before. And he says, I know you're kind. I know who you are. And you act like I'm wrong for defending my 
my own family, my own lifestyle. And I said, yeah, how you mean? And he goes into this rant about how Jerome with his Mercedes Benz and his big gold chain and teeth drives upstate, makes all this money, sleeps with his daughter. And next thing you know, there's no more white people in his family. And so his fear was based on genetic superiority, dominant versus recessive genes. We all know that like blonde hair, blue eyes, those are recessive genes which are overly, often overlapped by dominant genes. And he said, I'm at a fight for my survival of my race. Doesn't matter who you are, you represent the poison to my people genetically. And he had this other theories about monkeys and all kinds of other stuff because it didn't go too far from an intellectual conversation. But that concept, you know, I learned that from Dr. Francis Cress Wilson when I was young attending her schools, right? Um, and that this is fear that the black man can only take you, take, replace you. This is why we had this marching saying, we will not be replaced, right? Yes. Because as we see interracial marriages, as we see this sort of complexion of human rights and people can be who they want to be and be who what they want to be. There's this fear that the more that you succeed because there's a limited amount in this cup, the more that I lose, right? And in the concept of capitalism, yes, that's true, right? Because we live in a capitalist society. So the, the more that somebody takes, the more somebody loses. But in the concept of human life, these are, these are all social constructs. These are things we created, right? And so, Yes, I believe that fear. And for the first time, I understood why this person hated me. And then I had, you know, I tried to dig deeper, had questions like, why you got the ace of spades, only symbols. And he was like, well, it represents different pure white heritage. And that's the only thing I would accept into my organization because we're trying to preserve our race. And so it's that fear. It's the fear of the capitalistic structure that, you know, whites, blacks are gaining. And then, you know, whites are losing as blacks are gaining. And so both of those fears couple with a lack of intelligence, a lack of empathy, a barbaric nature, and you're going to attack someone, right? And so this is not a sentiment that all white Americans share. Like my sons have best friends of the white, I have friends of the white, and, and it's about the person and their integrity and humanity. But when you look at the generational influence from the 40s, the 30s, the 50s, the 60s. It was mostly passed down. Hatred is passed down, right? Racism is taught. I recently ordered uh, some Department of Education books. Um, and one was a mandatory reading called The Piccanini Twins. And this was a Department of Education book describing what a Negro and what a nigger is subhuman. And this is what people were taught in order to elevate that that sort of white privilege length for a couple of hundred years, even though they're just being used too, because the 1% never, you never lose, slave masters never, never retire. And so I think what explains more is Du Bois's statements in uh, the, the, the reconstruction. I think those first three paragraphs are most important when he spoke about white privilege and how they sort of come to this closing their ranks around whiteness, that there's an existential feeling, like you're not benefiting nothing financially, uh, uh, physically off of this, but you want to close the ranks around this whiteness and protect that. And uh, violence has always been the answer to protecting things by force, right? Mm -hmm. And so that fear is very real, but I challenge even myself, Terrence, because when he said that, Professor, it, it, it struck me, you know, I was a very knowledgeable person when I was incarcerated before I went inside. And so I understood this, I knew genetics, I understand dominant recessive genes, I understand that. But how he used that as and weaponized it as an attack for himself to validate the brutality that they commit on others is still used today and politically backed and supported financially, right? We've seen people storm the Capitol and get out on bail or parole and got six months and was like, can we defer to six months? Cause I gotta go take a trip to Mexico. Yeah. We have a system where predominantly no one will ever see a black juror people incarcerated aren't allowed to be on jury duty. There is no fair system from the point of capture to incarceration and overall 
in the same structure in society. Even in the street, you can't even win an argument. You can't stop a cop. You can't have a conversation. There is no humanity for people of color. And it's all stemming from this fear that if I allow these people to be equal, it'll be like Planet of the Apes. Mm. What do you say to America right now? Uh, we have our friends who are here with us today. This is also going to be heard from some of our friends at Humanity, uh, white and black, that will listen to our conversation today. Uh, I was thinking about the barbershop, although I don't, you know, y'all don't mess with me. Y'all don't. I, barbershop. However, <clears throat> I'm trying to see how I want to say this. I remember when I saw, and I shared this with my students. I remember when I saw the march on for the teacher tortures. I remember as a black man, I was in fear. Although I, you know, it's my first time as a, you know, I, you know, I've been in, some, you know, we've been in some things in my life, but that it was a different fear of my existence as being a black man when I saw that. May 14th, I'm gonna be very honest with you, what I saw was a lynching. That, that's in my mind, I saw a lynching of 10 people. I understood that there was a manifest added to this. I understood that as you shared that there were uh, uh, this was being shared with a broader community as this was taking place. How much do we attest or take in with that five that there could be more acts of violence perpetrated against blacks based upon this 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 current this this recent Event. One, um, he also on the side of his gun uh, and is in manifesto said, this is just a continuance of the other kid who was shooting. He had his name written on a gun and, and sort of honor. And I think Baldwin sums it up and I'm gonna reread a sentence that I had read in that those, those few pages. Americans today have little to do with real empathy, empathy on the contrary, indeed are involved only symbolically with color. And let me, let me just reread that. And I forgot the first sentence. And I submit then that the racial tenets that menace Americans today have little to do with real empathy. On the contrary, indeed, are involved only symbolically with color, right? And so I think what Baldwin is saying and what it, what it, what it reads to me is that you know, education is the key, but the lack of that, the ability to hold back certain caste systems of people for 100 years of being educated um, is really the gap, right? Understanding that this bigger picture um, is what impacts both of us, poor whites and poor blacks, right? These tensions are rooted um, in the very same depths as those which love springs or murder. So those same um, emotions come about where you love your race so much and you feel like this person is taking away from you, um, the real bigger picture is not understood because you're stuck in that moment of, there's a limited amount of things that I need from you. Um, yes, this is only a symbol that this is an organized system, right? Me and Sean King were just talking about this early this morning. Like, I wanna know who was watching. I wanna know who was on their phone on this Twitch app watching him murder black people and sending emojis and making comments, right? That's what the real investigation needs to be, but it will not be that because we live in a white privilege and a white controlled society where they're not investigating that, right? They're merely looking at who had felonies that were shot. That was the first investigation, who was criminal so that they can report that to the staff, right? The next investigation was on the store self itself, who was employed that day, who was working. This is the victim side. They're not even thinking about what was the real culprit of the situation. Not only was he patted on the back, but he was immediately placed into protective custody because I immediately got like 40 phone calls from people inside the prison system. Like, where's this guy going? What's, what's up? Where's he at? 
And so I believe that only through education, through more events like this, right? Having actual conversations about this, exploring history and the roots can we rechange the future. Only by using the past can we serve the present. And it's only through sort of pulling back that veil as the voice spoke about as well as Baldwin, that black people have to wear so people can see the pain and the suffering and so much that we have to go through that's gonna inspire true Americans and true people who believe in democracy, true people who believe in equality to stand together and change this country. But to say that there's not gonna be any more acts of violence is to ignore the past 500 years that has gave us well over the exempt amount. I mean, it's like 50 more films coming out just about black atrocities coming up in the next few years alone, right? It's like saying we're the only life in the universe. Meanwhile, we just found like 500 planets over here, just like 500 really quick. They're all livable, but just like 500 planets. But no, no, we're unique. It's, it's, it's only us. It's as fallible as that. I think that what you I just said. What I wanted to say is, I, I, when, I, when I spoke to my uncles about this, because I merely called like some of the elders, I spoke to Bobby Seale and he said, he reminded me, we cannot fight racism with more racism or hatred, we have to fight it with solidarity. And, and that, that kind of takes me, I was just gonna say when you said that, when, particularly in the vein of, of violence, I was thinking about a, a broadcast of Angela Davis uh, when she initially uh, was released and she was sharing when I think the commentator asked her about violence. And like you, she was, she, she, she was astounded that this question was asked of her as, you know, as a, a black woman, as a African-American uh, who had, you know, endured historical violence uh, perpetuated uh, upon, you know, black communities that continue to live in this state of uh, fear. And I hate to say that. Uh, I, I truly do hate to say that. I want to read something. Um, something in regards to what you, you, you shared about love. And uh, Laura Morrison is on here. And hopefully when our conversation was one of those things that we discussed. However, uh, and we'll get to that. And let me let me read this first. Well, the black man has functioned in a white man's world as a fixed star, an immovable pillar, and and as he moves out of his place, just back to that fear you're talking about. Uh, he moves out of his place. Heaven and earth are shaken to their foundations. You don't be afraid. I said that uh, it was intended that you should perish in the ghetto, uh, perish by never being allowed to go be, uh, behind the white man's definition, by never being allowed to spare your name properly. You have, and many of us have defeated this intention. And by a terrible law, a terrible paradox, those innocents who believe that your imprisonment made them safe are losing their grasp on reality. I say that, and, and particularly when you talked about that fear, because Baldwin goes on to share with his nephew in this writing about how we must come to a point of loving our, thank you, Laura, yes, how we must come to love our brothers. And, and it, it's a challenge of challenges of, of one's very own existence. One's very own existence requires, as you said, we can't fight racism with racism. We can't fight hate with hate. However, when you're, you're, you're in that paradox of existence, survival, How do we broach that space? And I'm saying this to you as another black man talking to another black man with a, a diverse group of people, women, uh, whites and blacks in this that as we sit as, you know, I like to say the barbershop, but there was a, 
time in history when the black folks used to go out behind the barn. <laughs> oh, uh, that was the barbershop then, yeah, but the so we, done, we done stepped up a little. We got barbershops now. Right. Because, you know, yeah. yeah, go, yeah, yeah, because in our, the communities, there's this, unfortunately, this fear that is lingering. Um, I, 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 it's just that fear that's lingering. And how do we, and let me say this, in the meantime, because there is a meantime, it's the idea of what we can achieve and where we hope to be as a society, as a people, as a, that, that, that space that you talked about earlier. However, how do we speak to the black community, the American community, today that uh, as we now try to grapple with what does this mean for us as in the in 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 the, in, in the idea of race relations in america well you know to answer that i really want to pull from a few people you know i was with malcolm's daughter last night we had the celebration of course of his 97th birthday and you know one of the things malcolm said is we have to build community just as much as we fight to have the space to build community right and so that's like double work but we also have to undo 400 years of programming because i don't want people to feel guilty because they look up to attributes um or only listen to truth when it comes to white teachers or sort of have this programming and don't feel why don't understand why like television is literally called television programming and so I look at all media in America as propaganda, and I always try to see the underlying message of it. But from a greater concept of the average person, I think it's more so one for people who are not of color. Uh, it's what you said what Angela's response was, is when I hear that, when I hear people ask me, and she laughed like at the sense of violence, and it actually had that video on my YouTube channel. Um, it just, it just shocks and amazes me that this person that is asking me this has no idea of what the black existence is. And of course, Baldwin describes that as rage, right? Rage is a justifiable emotion. It is when you have been validated, violated at your core as a human being, as a person, and that you have no other choice but for your own survival to defend yourself, right? How does that survival play out? because people always related to all of this gun violence that is happening, is that you have people who are the younger generation is not knocking on the door anymore asking for crumbs and leftovers, like they're going to kick the door in and take it, right? But I think the greatest part of what needs to be done comes from, I'm just going to reread another line that I said from this excerpt with Baldwin in these few pages. How can one respect, let alone adopt, the values of a people who do not on any level whatsoever, live in the way they say they do or the way that they should. Right? And so if we look at ourselves as one being of people, of human beings, not one dominant, one recessive, one top and any other, none of that, but in a level that we're all human beings, then we have a long way to go to be honest with each other. We have a long way to go to healing. And it means that you have to look at what's happening in my life which is why they banned CRT, right? I don't even want to mention that. They may take it off the air on this show, right? And in uh, that concept, we need to also educate ourselves because we have 400 years of training to undo. We have 400 years of looking up to people, trying to look like people who don't respect us, who are actually trying to look like us, right? I used to live downtown on 23rd Street and I've seen people going to tanning salons and curling their hair and across the street, people were straightening their hair and trying to look like each other in some concept. And, and, and that, that, that sort of unity needs to happen in order for us to over, overcome this as a survival technique for all human beings. But harm to one is harm to all. Mm -hmm. And to do for one is to do for all. And that small concept of if you look at racial harm, right? There's this is viral video of this guy. And I actually reached out to him. His name is Jason Wade. He's on Facebook. He's an amazing dude. He's a, he's a Lyft driver. And he gets this couple in his car. And she's like, oh, you're like, wow, you're a white guy. And like, oh, I mean, like you speak English, right? 
And she was trying to say that he wasn't black as a joke because he was a driver. And he was like, no, nah, you get out the car. And he kicked her out. And then her boyfriend was like, I'm gonna punch you. He was like, yeah, whatever. Click, cop the seatbelt. Like he was ready to go. Like he was opening the door like what? Get out and I'm calling the cops and it's all on video and they're all gonna know, right? That type of boldness in a space alone, right? That is equal, that's a true ally, but that's a person who's like, no, if you're being racist, it's like insulting me, right? And so that's the America we, we have to be. That is the country we have to be. We literally have to be the words we wrote because as Baldwin said, we live up to people. We've been programmed for 400 years. I'm not putting blame on anybody, right? We've been programmed for over 400 years to look up to people who don't look up to us. And those who are allies in this work have to embody bias and racism as it's an attack on themselves, right? Let me say this because it's interesting that you said that. This is on page 44. Therefore, whatever white people do not know about Negroes it reveals precisely and inexorably what they do not know about themselves. And there's this idea that this violence being being perpetrated against uh, African Americans and people of color because now this is expanded and this is why I this is called the revolution of the social justice movement. And when Baldwin wrote the fire next time, he was talking about a future where not only the uh, 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 participants in this would be on you know would expand, but also those. Uh, colleague uh, uh, advocates and uh, 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 individuals who would be sympathetic. I don't want to say to our cause, but to the cause of freedom, to the cause of equity and equality. Because for any country, any individual, anything, if we're not all achieving that, then that country is not reaching its fullest. And that was another part I'm going to uh, share at the end in which uh, Baldwin shared about that if there is no space or, or, or for equity equal, for, for the, the, the black man in this country, then America will not under any circumstances meet her fullest potential as a country. Um, and you know, at, and, and uh, although we're able to sit here today and uh, have this uh, intellectual in exchange of, of thoughts or reflection and of Baldwin's words and what that means to us today, because there's still the fear that I have that if I turn on the television and we hear another, or we hear another black man has been shot you know, at the hands of police. Are we here? And again, this goes back to, as you shared that historical trauma that America lives with, particularly black America. But what I'm, I'm starting to realize is also, it's a trauma that a white American lives with. How would you, and we have about three minutes before we're going to open this up to an open conversation with our participants uh, here today, uh, Five. But how would you describe that historical trauma that we as America now sit, sit in? I, I, I'm, I'm going to state it really quickly as, as Baldwin put it. I cannot accept the proposition that the 400 year travels of the American Negro should result merely in his attainment of the present level of the American civilization, right? And so um, one, we need more to bring also a system of black love, right? That's the sort of healing that we need to have to build our own communities independently to protect ourselves. That's also a protective measure, right? Uh, two, we're much more than just catching up, right? We're, it's not about catching up. It's about living our own individual lives as Americans, but equally. It's also, I think it's gonna take this extreme period where people understand the struggles and the, the sort of juxtaposed existences in America. Like I live in New York, 
It's called New York, New York. Everybody here knows it because there's a poor New York and there's a, there's a rich New York. Uh, you can live in a shelter and you can live in a mansion and both of them have million dollar differences and exist in the same block. And so with that, uh, the richest district and the richest building in, in, in America and some of the richest people in America live here in New York, yet I live in the poorest district in the United States of America, New York 15. Average family income is $11,000. And so our focus needs to also be in taking pride in who we are and not thinking about the current level of American civilization, but expounding beyond that, going beyond that to our full level of potential and our own safety of our own communities that we build. Um, it's gonna take that and allies understanding that you need to correct the right of maybe your forefathers and not accept those same existence. It's like progress through creation, right? Like I want my son to be better than me. I want him to look at me and say, oh, I'm not gonna do that. My dad does that, right? And so we have to look at the past in that concept, right? And so white Americans, black Americans, all colors in this country must come together because then we're the majority. And that is the country. The problem is that this race has been used as a divide. Caste system, structural systems of income inequality has been used to divide us when we actually have the solution of just joining together and being together in the majority. And it's gonna take much more than us as black people, because this is who he was speaking to. He was speaking to this. He was speaking to us, even though I use the analogy to speak about the future. He was speaking that black Americans need to stop trying to live up and achieve to the next level, right? I have kids sleep on our air mattresses, but they look a million bucks because their perception of a man is more important than the substance of a man today. And the appearance of a man is more important than the substance of a person, right? Wow. And uh, that has been just that we need to live comfortably. In our work, we call it fake it till you make it, right? Get in the room so that you can have the most experience until you can get the paycheck. But in this concept, we're faking citizenship. We're faking equality. We're faking safety when we actually have fears. And we can't even call the law enforcement department because like in this case, when they called the operator, she hung up on him twice. And then they had the recording, which was very disrespectful and allowed the shooting to happen. They called him and said, this kid was here last night. And so there is no validation uh, for black Americans in this country until we build it. And until we build our own network and build our own businesses, build our own industries and build our own products and then shop those products, stop valuing Gucci. Why do I see people going to the store and supporting systems that have uh, historically oppressed us? And so when I say community, that means income, income, income equality within our own neighborhood, shop in our own districts, keep that dollars within our own community. That's what America is. America is an accumulation of different communities, different races, and different societies. And for us to be Americans, we have to equally recognize the pain and suffering of others, the inequality of others, and we have to work toward fixing that. And that's gonna take every step of the way. And can we expect more violence? Yes. That is inevitable as this last shooting and us thinking that another one won't happen right before the other one and the one before that and then the one before that and then hundreds of years in the past. Bob, I wanna thank you so much for joining us here today. What we wanna do at this juncture, I truly, and I, and I, you know, I got a way of pointing people out, but I don't think that we would have to do that. I would love to hear from um, our participants, uh, your thoughts on today's conversation, the May 14th shooting. What does that look like for as a, country and as each of us as individuals in this country who lived through that traumatic event and i'll leave it well actually i will call on uh adia uh to share with us her views her thoughts uh on today's conversation uh in relations to baldwin um first of all i just wanted to thank mr five for sharing his views i was just telling my friends uh from silver to come and watch this or see if there's a recording thought it was really powerful and uh something that really stood out to me is about what he was just talking about in terms of capitalism and how it profits of the labor of people of color um especially by doing stuff like supporting certain brands or um just really being mindful of where you're money is going and what message you're really sending out to the world is so important. 
Um, in, in terms of Mr. Baldwin's work, I think something that really stood out to me is how we were talking about there is no individual freedom without collective freedom. And I think that is a message we keep seeing repeated, but we don't really know what it means. And I think what it means is exactly this, being very mindful of how like every little action you do contributes to a much bigger thing in the world. Like everything is interconnected. And as people of color, I think being mindful of those little things can, can really go a long way in essentially you know creating a place that is more accepting of all different identities and not just picking and choosing certain people who are allowed to exist and other identities that are not allowed to exist or you're only you know black enough or brown enough if you do this but you're not if you do something else so um I think those are some of the thoughts I was having and I would love to hear what everyone else is thinking because I saw some amazing comments okay Thank you so much. Uh, Dorian. High five. Um, wow, th th this session was really, really powerful. It hit home for a lot of reasons. Um, and I wanna thank Adia for amazing comments. And um, whew, my family lives in Buffalo. Um, they don't live on that side. My coworkers from Osborne have an office there. Um, one family member was lost um, from my colleagues. And um, it's hard to swallow that we're still here 500 years later. It's hard to swallow as an African-American woman with an African-American son who's been pulled over plenty of times, pulled out of cabs, searched for no reason, stopped and frisked for no reason. Um, and mind you, my son is very light-skinned. He looks Hispanic actually, but he fits a description, right? And um, the fear that has been programmed in us for generations that we're not good enough um, we're not capable enough, we're not smart enough, we're not educated enough, we're not pretty enough, we're not, you know, we're not enough, but we're too much. We're doing so much at the same time. Um, it really disturbs my spirit that we have to have these conversations and create a narrative for them to understand that it's the savagery we learned from you, the rape we learned from you, the murder we learned from you, the hatred we learned from you. Um, from the way you brought us here and forced us to be a certain way. Why are you so angry? Why am I angry? Some mornings I wake up, I dread looking at the news because I don't wanna be angry today. I'm not just an angry black woman. I'm a concerned black woman that um, my, my king, my African-American man cannot walk down the street and go to the store and come back home safe. My son can't, you know, go out and enjoy standing outside with his friends, just having a conversation without the police harassing him. Um, it's just, it's just incredible that we're still here. And, um, you know, my, my heart goes out to all the families who've lost loved ones due to violence, but specifically to those that were targeted because of race. And, um, and that's all races, just because of your race, because of your religion, because of what you look like or what they think you represent. Um, my heart just goes to all of those individuals. And I just wanna say five, your readings and your, your breakdowns were so powerful today. Thank you. Thank you, Queen. Um, I wanna add to that, you know, one, um, I believe the answer is, you know, we must organize. I mean, we must organize together. I grew up in a, in, a, in a panther compound. My family's Black Panthers, Young Lords. And so I've seen people of all races, all nationalities working together to create a community. But more than a community of, I'm going to go dedicate to this nonprofit two hours a week. But they packed up their stuff and moved and lived in that world uh, and lived in the world of taking care of each other and created most of the programs that the government takes credit for today, right? 
uh, Hep C, door to door, all these things. And so it is a possibility, but when you, when you really study history, you look at civilization and we look up to people who stole civilization or stole the object from us and then sells it back to us as if we nature them. But I just wanna remind everybody that there is this one, 2% that is here. And then you have whites, poor whites, and you have poor blacks as well, even middle class now because they allowed this middle class bubble to exist. But if you take it back to the shores of Jamestown, like we did in the 400, the 400 years of inequality project, there was equality, poor whites and poor blacks worked in the same house, right? When they built HRA housing, they built it next to the warehouses that they then outsourced out and left people living there in these sort of de deplorable conditions. And that's when redlining came up because, okay, we made enough money from this hundreds of years of cotton sales and all these years of sort of industries that you guys have worked and broke your back to, as Baldwin says, for nothing, we've done all of this for nothing, that that period allowed whites to then have property, which then leads to this sort of racial and, and, and economical gap today. But if you take it back, like I said, to Jamestown, it wasn't equality. And then throughout these 500 years, this 1% is still getting bigger. Now we see their grandkids like buying ships and boats and doing dumb shit because they just have so much money and so much privilege and so much inheritance. And so we need to recognize that we're both juxtaposed on the same side of a game and that there is a common enemy, an, an enemy in some sense in this country. And that is the dominant sort of white pervasive system. Like you take Jeff Bezos, you take all these other people, like I'm gonna give you even better uh, adaption before I go off another rant, is um, this guy that just bought Twitter. Like his, 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 his money, and I'm gonna say his name, his money literally comes from his father who, uh, who, 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 who made his pop stops apartheid in South Africa. And so he's taking slave money, segregation money, and building an empire here in America. And that's okay because the system of capitalism allows that, right? The notion that private is okay and that public is a problem. We need more public solutions. We need more public access. If we had no private schools and public schools, rich and poor would have to be educated in the same level. And we wouldn't have the two different miseducations. We wouldn't have the textbooks that whites were taught, that blacks were inferior and they were superior. And then we have the books that blacks are taught, which is all of the deities, all of the gods are whites and all of the teachers are white and everything you look up to is white and nothing was created by you. And so we still teach this history. We still are teaching people that Columbus discovered America. Like we still have this biased education and so the soil, in more of a spiritual sense, the soil is damaged. And when the soil is damaged, nothing grown in that can come from it. Wow. I like and that. I feel bad for these kids. I'm just going to be honest. I'm on Twitter posting, and my uncle's calling me like, what are you doing? Take them posts down. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, these people are evil. <laughs> They're going against. He's like, listen, these people, and it goes back to what you said about Trump, were told they're important. They were giving the resources to do this. When you look at the person who assassinated King, I have that video on my YouTube too. He literally was like, yeah, the CIA paid for the hotel room. Yeah, I hated King. They drove me out there. They gave me the room across from him and then I shot him. I just did that part. But the government empowered me to do that. And then 20 years later, we find out about it and that's the year we made MLK Day, right? So we have this pervasive system that allows us to move forward with this inequality. We need an absolute stop and a sort of reshifting of our agenda and include building our own communities. When do we stop still fighting and struggling for equality? And through that will come, will come education of the past and also attribution to those who are allies to support a new future. So that's the way I feel, but what you said is so true, Queen, and that we're not gonna get over it until we have more discussions, in-depth understanding of history, in-depth understanding of equality, and then I'll teach you how to move forward, you know? together. I thank you, Five. Uh, Dr. Barnaby. Hi, are you hearing me? Yes. Am I clear? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me to this space. Um, five, what you've been doing is just really great, Terrence. Everybody here, this is so empowering. Um, as an educator, I am perplexed. I feel a bit despondent sometimes, but when you come to this space, it reminds you of the power that you have, that you think you don't have, but that you truly have. 
But what is disheartening about this is when I teach criminal justice, and when those students are sitting in that space and we're talking about policing and the attack on the black bodies and what that means, there's a sea of silence that means a lot, right? So one is that students sometimes get frustrated because they don't really understand the historical context. So they feel like they can't engage. And even though you, you know, there's scaffolding in the lesson, they somehow just can't get it, right? Or the student who feels ashamed about being who they are as black and brown people, right? And so there's no participation. And so, and I know educators in my space who are like, I'm done. I don't know what to do. So if a student doesn't take a class that speaks directly to history and understand that, they just don't know. The conversation is not happening in the household. They don't have resources. They don't have spaces where they're truly understanding their history. Because if you don't understand that, then you don't know what to do. All these things are happening. I went to class to talk about Buffalo, the, the shooting, and, and students were, oh God, this again? Black and brown students, this again, meaning we have heard it. One student said, that's what white people do. They shoot up things, right? And that student was comfortable in accepting that, right? So when I come to a space like this, I am empowered and I'm encouraged. And it's time for us to cross thread and for me to connect with you five and for me to continue to have conversation with Terrence and other people in this forum to see how we can bring those conversations to the classroom so we can have our black and brown kids more encouraged and understand their history to really recognize their present to then know what that future is going to look like if they don't stand up and stand tall in who they are as black and brown people and that's where i end my preaching thank you so much for the forum thank you you know i i historically there's something called role reversal that i think about when i think about the slaughter of these uh, 10 innocent people or these 10 people when I think about uh, Nat Turner. That is a conversation that we don't have in there because it, it creates, and I don't know if any of you, even when I think of it, it's almost like that fear of like, well, we're talking about, but we can see it through the lens of what we're seeing and something Dr. Barnaby just said, where the violence is now seemingly against our Blacks is being normalized. Oh, that again, oh, so much so you, we, we, we as people of color can look at that violence, whether it's this or whatever form, and it's almost like, yeah, what, what do we expect? What should we expect? Um, I, you, you guys know I like to really keep this engaging. Uh, Laura, uh, is there anything like you, you, that you would like to add to this conversation on what we've discussed today uh, in light of the Buffalo shooting? Um, going back, I was taking some notes. Uh, you know, one of the things that really amazes me is the empathy that Five ex expressed in this incredibly painful time. It, and this, this is not as, you know, isolated and as Five said, as you've all said, this has happened historically and it is happening again and again and again. This is a lynching, this is a massacre and it's ongoing, but that empathy for the white people, understanding the motivation and discussing that, that conversation he had with the Aryan in the box next to him, you know, in solitary. And, you know, and that goes back to love and we have to understand and we have to come together and we have to love each other. And, you know, there's, was it in what, uh, the, the, the portion that uh, I've read that I'm going back to where, you know, white people cannot be taken as the models of how to live. Um, that a white man himself is in sore need of new standards, which will release him from his confusion and place him once again in fruitful communion with the depths of his own being. And I feel that is very much what all white people have to do. And so we have to, find those new standards and we have to come forward and be part of this you know, effort and solidarity to change the future. 
So that, that really came out for me and what you all said. And I, I thank you for letting me be part of it. Thank you. Could, could I just address really quick? So Caroline, the, the sister who I just spoke, um, I would love for you to reach out. You know, uh, we have uh, contact information is, is on the site. Uh, because this is why about seven, eight years ago, Incarcerated Nation Network put together a team of survivors and post-incarcerated leaders to be sort of guest speakers in your class. So you can fill your class with different voices. Uh, this way, your oppositional won't be too hard. We teach in so many different classes across the spectrum of criminal justice to social justice. Uh, number two, survival. Uh, you know, love is really hate misconstrued. And so what people are feeling out of jealousy is that they actually love maybe what you have, right? And I remember the answer is not to demonize or enemy, <clears throat> as, as, as Professor Coffey has said, anyone else who's watching this program, anybody who's watching this and viewing this, when, you know, my uncle Fred was, uh, he was a, a chairman for the Black Panther Party in Chicago. And he, what the Panther Party really did was they went to create different communities and speak to different communities. So when it was, an attack on them from some white nationalists, they went to a poor white community and started to ask, what is the underlying, they ended up becoming the, the patriots, what is the underlying issues that is impacting your anger against the black community, right? Well, we don't have decent housing, we're gonna have decent housing too. We don't have trash pick, we're gonna have trash pickup too. And so you start realizing that the oppression on both sides is really the state and the government. And they became allies, right? It is, you know, we say white power to white people when we say black power to black people, brown power to brown people, because it is about empowering all of us and those jokes and those sort of juxtaposed situations of inequality allows us to fight and that's what holds us back, right? That you think somebody else is taking instead of saying the real underlying reason us into what your inequality is, is the same system, the same government structure that we have a problem with. So we actually have more in commonality and we're actually a little bit larger if we fight together, right? And we can actually get it overturned, right? And so I think the change will come when we ourselves apply ourselves, but we have to always look at the oppositional side and say, what is empowering that person? It's not just that these people are evil and just demonic people who are always gonna do hateful things. It's based on a fear that we're taking physical things from them. This is where the importance of capitalism comes in. This is where the game of uh, sort of inequality and racial inequality and caste systems, as Michelle Alexander calls it, is useful as a tool and a weapon to create division and lack of progress. Again, um, we have come to the close of this series. I want to thank Tracy. Uh, Tracy, I want to thank Five, and I want to thank each of you for joining us uh, in this third series of our reading and discussion of James Baldwin's Fire Next Time. Our next event will be posted on my site, so please be looking out for it. I'll send that over to you. Uh, in closing, um, I'm going to read our last passage. That is the crux of the work that I do here for this series. Uh, and after that, uh, we will go out with uh, a memory in memory of our fallen uh, citizens in Buffalo. And here we are at the center of the art, trapped in the gaudiest, most valuable, most improbable water wheel the world has ever seen. Everything now we must assume is in our hands. We have no right to assume otherwise. If we, and now mean, the relatively conscious whites and the relatively conscious blacks who must, like lovers, insist on or create the consciousness of the others do not falter in our duty now. We may be able, handful that we are, to end the racial nightmare and achieve our country and change the history of the world. If we do not dare, if we do not now dare everything, the fulfillment of that prophecy recreated from the Bible in a song by a slave is upon us. God gave Noah the rainbow sign no more water, the fire next time. Thank you for joining us.